Okay, so we are on our fourth lesson of the fall quarter in the book of Philippians, and that is Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, through chapter 3, verse 11, and the title of the lesson is Paul's Pastoral Concern. And we're going to look about how to reject legalism in this lesson. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this very upbeat and joyous uh, letter to the Philippians. We do pray that uh, we would learn from Paul's instruction about how to avoid legalism and uh, how that is another principle that can give us joy. So we seek your Spirit's illumination as we look at this. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first section is Paul's commendation of Timothy. And, uh, you know, last week we learned our second principle was to be a servant. Being a servant will give you joy. And Paul last week talked about Jesus as the ultimate servant and then about himself as a servant and now he's going to give two more examples of servanthood. One is Timothy, and the other is Epaphroditus. So this uh, first section is Paul's commendation of Timothy. Somebody want to read 19 through 24? That did sound a little different. Okay, let me read that section while people are finding their place here. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Okay? Yeah, so verses 19 and 20, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you. And the reason he was sending Timothy to find out how they were doing, because he wanted to be encouraged when he learned of their condition. And then he says something interesting. I have no one else of kindred spirit as himself. And the kindred spirit that he would genuinely be concerned for their welfare. So Tim Timothy was a person who thought of others first. And that is what Paul is trying to teach the Philippians. It's the way to have joy. So, you know, I have a little anecdote about this. You know, Susanna and I were planning to go on a picnic last week, and we were going to go to Alder Lake, which is a very nice place. And then my mother called and needed help moving. And so I went down Wednesday, and Susanna was working, and then she and I went down Thursday. And so we brought sandwiches, and they didn't come right away. And so we had a picnic sitting in front of uh, their old house, which had junk all over the yard, and there were yellow jacks, jackets flying all around. And it was joyful. It was joyful because we were serving other people, and we were having our picnic in the sunshine with a bunch of junk all around us. <laughs> it was wonderful, you know. So serve, serving gives you joy. That's the moral of that story. Yeah, so anyway, then Paul goes on to say, for they all seek after, this is verse 21, they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. Now that makes you wonder, is he speaking of Christians? Yeah, I, I don't think he is, but I, you know, they're either Christians who are not walking in the Spirit, which is possible, or they're unbelievers. You know, because this, is, this is a young church. The Philippian church? Yes. The Philippian church, when he wrote this, was about 10 years old. Really? Well, 
you know, yeah. he had he had founded it about ten years earlier. That's true. It takes time to grow and spiritually. The desire to do it. Yeah, well. to grow spiritually, exactly. Yeah, Paul says, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your wel welfare, for they all seek after their own interests. Yeah, so I, I do believe these are either carnal Christians or unbelievers he's mm -hmm. speaking about who seek after their own interests. And, uh, you know, it's it's something we have to learn because we don't naturally want to serve. After you do it for a while, you realize that it does give you joy to do it, and that makes you less reluctant <laughs> to do it again. Mm -hmm. Yes, do all things without <laughs> grumbling and disputing. And of course, joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Right, exactly, and that's what we want to bring out. So, verse 22, But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. So Timothy had proven worth. Now, don't you want people to say that about you? You want to live a life so that people would say, that person has proven worth. And so I'm going to read you from or something from last quarter. This is Proverbs. 20 and verse 6. And Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? So you want to be trustworthy. And then this passage is also Proverbs 22 verse 6. And that is not correct, so I'm not going to read that one. No, no, it's 22 verse 1. A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. And that is what Timothy had, was a good name. So in Luke 16 verse 10, Jesus said, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. That's what Jesus calls, Jesus does not call us to success. He calls us to faithfulness. Yeah, and the success will be created by him if we are faithful. So that's in Philippians. So verse 23, Therefore I hope to send him, Timothy, immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. So what things were going on with Paul? He said, as soon as I see how things go with me. Right. He was in prison. He was in prison in Rome, and he wanted to be judged by Caesar. So that's what he's talking about, seeing how things go with me, how his trial before Caesar would go. Okay, so he sent Timothy, a very reliable person, to Philippi to get news from them because he wants to know what's going on. And that's the end of that section. So now we're on section B. So we're in uh, Philippians 2, verse 25. Okay, can I get some? And this is Paul's commendation of Epaphroditus. So can I get somebody to read verses 25 through 30? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so Paul, verse 25, Paul sent Epaphroditus back, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Remember, one of the main reasons for this letter was Paul thanking the Philippians for a fin financial gift, and the financial gift was brought by Epaphroditus. And so... He sent them back. They sent him with a monetary gift. Verse 26 and 27, he was longing for you because he was distressed. You had heard that he was sick. And he was sick almost to death. Now, why do you think Paul just didn't heal him? Why didn't Paul just heal him? See, this goes to spiritual gifts. 
And uh, we have some denominations that believe that all of the gifts are still active, including healing. Okay, there was a gift of healing, a spiritual gift of healing. And Paul had that gift. So now don't go to this place. I'm just going to read it to you. But Acts 14, verse 8. This is Paul at Lystra. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. That is the gift of healing. Which acted as a witness. Which acted as a witness to the message. Exactly. And so also, Acts 19, verse 11. No, Acts, yeah, Acts 19, verse 11. This is while Paul was in Ephesus. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. So if you brought a hanky to Paul and he held it, and you took it back to the sick person, the sick person would be well. Or, or if he was demonized, the demon would leave. Yeah. That was a special time. That was early in the church, and the Lord, through all the apostles, was performing many, many miracles. And that ha began to fade as the New Testament was written. Okay, so as the New Testament was written and we, the canon was being completed, those things were fade, fading, and so t ten years later now, Paul is in prison, and Epaphroditus is sick almost to the point of death. Paul did not heal him because he no longer had that gift. Okay? That gift was a sign that the message was true. And so now it was the Lord who healed him. Okay, I'm sure they prayed for Epaphroditus. The Lord healed him, and it is still that way today. That's how it works today. That's why in James chapter 5 it says, If you are sick, call the elders of the church to come to you. They will anoint you with oil and pray for you, and you'll be made well, if it is the Lord's will that you're well. And so... Um, because God has his own special time. He may will that you are sick. He willed that Paul was sick. Because Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I do think it had something to do with his vision. And he prayed three times that the Lord would take it away, and the Lord said, no, I'm not going to make you well. Because this is to keep you humble. And uh, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. So if, you know, I, I do think that if you're, you're sick, you're concerned about something, and I've done it two or three times, call the elders of the church to pray, anoint you with oil. Once was about my back, which was very severely hurting me. I thought it would make me quit work, and it was healed immediately. And once was the most recent, was about my eyes. You know, and I haven't noticed any great difference in my eyes, but I, my test was improved after the elders prayed for me. And so, you know, the Lord still does that. Huh? When they prayed for you, did they lay? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking about these manifestations that people say, um, you know, there are some denominations that teach that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Right. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyway, I just wanted to point out that even in Paul's day, the gift of healing had passed away. Okay. And in the second Timothy also is a passage where it says I, he left Trophimus sick in Troas. So he left somebody sick toward the end of his life because he didn't have the gift of healing. And apparently he prayed for him and the Lord said, not yet. And one thing that. Yeah, we have to pay attention to the scripture. 
and what it is telling us. So, um, yeah, we all have various gifts, but we do not have signed gifts anymore. We have gifts of administration. We have gifts of teaching. We have gifts of mercy. Um, we have gifts of helps, that sort of thing. Um, and those are active, legitimate gifts of the Spirit. So verse 28, Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again you may rejoice. Again, remember that's what this book is about. And I may be less concerned about you. So they're going to send Epaphro he's going to send Epaphroditus back so that they can see him. They'll rejoice. Paul will rejoice. He doesn't have to worry about him as much. So as we follow the Lord, we will cause our fellow believers to rejoice. Isn't that good? We will cause our fellow believers to rejoice. As we follow the Lord, as we follow the Lord and we do what the Lord tells us, then we cause other believers to rejoice. Because we, the other believers see our growth, and they're like, that's great. <laughs> that is great. You know, we, we all want to see each other grow. It pleases God. Yeah, it pleases everybody. Yeah, because when you grow, you're more and more like Jesus. And that pleases everybody except the demons. <laughs> Yeah, who cares about what, what, they, what they want? So verse 29, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, again there's the word joy, and hold men like him in high regard. Okay, so that's like Timothy, isn't it? Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. That's like what Jesus said, take up your cross, right? Epaphrodite, Epaphroditus did this almost to the point of death. So we want to serve the Lord. We all have a gift that we can use for service. That's the purpose of the spiritual gifts. The purpose of them is not for ourselves. It is for others to serve them. So using our gifts gives others and us joy. So we want to serve and we want to use our gifts to do it. Amen. So we're moving on to the next section now. Now, Paul goes a little negative, so he's commending Timothy and Epaphroditus in section C. We have Paul's condemnation of the Judaizers. And this brings up our third principle for joy, and that is to avoid legalism. Avoid legalism. We want to avoid two things. We want to avoid licentiousness, which is not following anything, doing whatever we feel like. And we want to avoid legalism, which is obeying and forcing other people to obey man-made rules. Okay? So examples of man-made rules today in churches would be no dancing, no card playing, no going to the movies. There are some churches that enforce this. I know that uh, Jim, Pastor Jim grew up in a church like that. It was a free church up in, up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there is um, the, the danger of that. And so... Uh, so can I get somebody to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 4? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so look what he says about these people. Verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard to you. And then he says, Beware of the dogs. <laughs> Beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. So Paul is serious about legalism. He's calling them dogs. And um you know, we we would say, Oh, don't you know, don't do that. Paul is doing it. And and in uh, verses two and three he contrasts 
what he calls the false circumcision to the true circumcision. Now, where did circumcision come from? Now, it is in the Mosaic Law. In Leviticus 12, don't go there. <laughs> Leviticus 12, verse uh, 2 and 3, it says this. When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. That's the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant. Now, before that, you know, a few hundred years before that, God went to Abraham after he had made the uh, Abrahamic covenant with him, he gave him a sign for the Abrahamic covenant. And that sign is recorded in Genesis 17, verse 10. It says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign... Dr. Fruchtenbaum said the token, the sign, the token of the covenant between me and you. So the token of the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision. The token of the Mosaic covenant is the Sabbath. Remember? He told us about that last week too. So the Mosaic law is not a permanent covenant. The Mosaic Covenant. It is a temporary covenant until the death of the Messiah. And so Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, this is in Matthew 5, Matthew 5 and verse 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of Moses or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So the question is, when was all accomplished? And when all was accomplished, according to the law, was in John 19 and verse 30. Jesus was hanging on the cross. He had gone through all the, you know, degradations of everybody. And just before he gave up his spirit, he said, it is finished. That's when it was accomplished. Okay, so the Mosaic Law was completed at that time. And he used the word tetelestai in the Greek, which means paid in full. The Mosaic Law was accomplished because Jesus completed it. He, he obeyed it. Every little detail, he obeyed it. Something that no one else was able to do. And then he died on behalf of those who are not able to complete it. So through the New Covenant then, we have a circumcision not of the flesh, of the foreskin, but of the heart, right? And Romans, and this is in Romans 2.29, says that. You know, a girl can't have a circumcision, right? Romans 2.29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. So, and that is through the new covenant, you know. The new covenant was the blessing part of the Abrahamic covenant. It is not fulfilled yet, because it will be fulfilled by the Jewish nation at the end of the tribulation period, but we are benefiting from it. When Jesus instituted the church, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And the new covenant in his blood means that we get the Holy Spirit when we're saved. And that is the circumcision of the heart. 
Because the Holy Spirit makes us alive. It makes us spiritually alive. Okay? So that is what, and what these people were doing was saying, to be saved, you must be circumcised. That is not true. Now, I will say that if you are born a Jew today, I think you should be circumcised. And why do I say that? Because the Abrahamic covenant is ongoing. But it's not to Gentiles. It is to Jew, the Jews. So, you know, I think if I was a Jewish believer in the Messiah, I would circumcise my sons for that reason. Um, but this, the Philippian church is a Gentile church predominantly. And people, Jewish people were coming, you know, Jewish believers were coming and saying, you must be circumcised to be saved. And Paul said, no. You, you, that is not necessary. And if you try to do that, you're going to ruin your faith. You're going to ruin your faith. So, um, through the new covenant, we have circumcision of the heart, right? And that is the operation of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And then he goes on to say that we are the true circumcision and that we put no confidence in the flesh. We do not trust the flesh because the flesh tends toward evil. So we walk by the Spirit. And how do we do that? How do you, you know, this took me many years to figure out. <laughs> how do you walk by the Spirit? You read the Bible. And the, when the, Bi the Lord speaks to you through the Bible, and the, the portions that are to us in the church age are the upper room discourse, in John 13 through 17, that's when Jesus was laying out the principles of the church. So the Last Supper? Yeah, the Last Supper. And the epistles, or the letters of the New Testaments, this is one. And also the letters that Jesus sent through John to the churches in Asia in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Those are to us. And those are the ones we pay attention to. So when, you know, so all the stuff in the Old Testament about the circum, about the, uh, about uh, the feasts, the festivals, the Sabbath, the uh, all the ceremonial laws, the uh, sacrifices, the way you wear your clothes, the food laws, and all that do not pertain to us. Now, if we want to observe some of those things, we are free to do so. As long as they don't contradict what this tells us. The only the only place I, I know of where the Mosaic Law contradicts what Dr. Fruchtenbaum called the Law of Christ was in regard to marriage. Because in regard to marriage, in the Mosaic Law, if you found something unpleasant or un something in your wife, you could write her a certificate of divorce and send her away. In the in the church that is not the Lord says no, you can't <laughs> do that. You cannot do that. It's for life. One man, one woman for life. So that's the only place I know of where it would contradict. You know, some of the Mosaic law is impossible to obey now. So anyway, we walk by the Spirit. Extra biblical requirements we ignore. Okay? When people say, you must worship on the Sabbath, you know, like the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, we're not told to worship on any particular day. We're told to meet together. That's, the, that's in the Mosaic Law. Yeah. The Mosaic Law has ended. So we... Um, we we could choose to have our services on Tuesday. That would be fine. You know, the reason we do it on Sunday is it was started by the very early church. It's the day the Lord rose from the dead. That's why we do it. We do it. 
<laughs> yeah, no, we do it because that's the day the Lord rose from the dead. And so, so you know, people and you know have said, oh, I, you know, you have to observe the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath, you know, from Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. That is the Sabbath. And, and also, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we worship the Lord every day. We worship the Lord every day, but we meet together, you know, as a as a body on Sundays. And um, but you know, like uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum's church meets on Saturday because they're a messianic congregation and they like it that way. <laughs> and so, okay, that's awesome. You know, that's great. So anyway, as long as people don't, you know, and that's what the Judaizers are doing here. And uh, they were, and that's what legalism does. Legalism, you know, that means others want to constrict you, and want to take away your freedom, and want to be your, you know, a scold. We don't want to do that. You know, we want to follow what it says here, and give freedom. Okay, so we're in section D now. Paul's contention for himself. And I'm going to repeat uh, verse 4 and go to verse 6. We're really moving fast. Not, no. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So Paul is giving his credentials according to the flesh. That's, that's like today saying, I was born into the family of the Kennedys. I attended Harvard, you know, etc. I sit on the Supreme Court all this sort of stuff. That is what Paul is saying here. He had credentials in the flesh. So he had an excellent pedigree. He was committed to Pharisaic legalism. Paul was, before he was saved. To the point that he was persecuting the church. See, in our Life of Messiah class, we, we learned how the, the Pharisees lost the intent of the law of Moses by legalism, by making man-made rules to insulate the law so that they wouldn't have to go back to Babylon again. <laughs> That's, that was the idea initially. And they twisted it around so much that it was unrecognizable. And, um, and Paul was a very good Pharisee, and he was taught by Gamaliel, which is a very well-respected Pharisee in Jerusalem itself. So he has he was a more committed legalist than any of these Judaizers could ever hope to be. He was more like them than they ever were before he was saved to the point of killing people. You know, he helped execute Stephen. And then he and that, so that is Paul's um, contention for himself. You know, I have, I have all these credentials that you want. And then he goes on, and this is section C, which is Paul's confession of faith. So this is uh, verses 7 through 11. This is just an awesome passage. But whatever things were gained to me, the, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. See, all of his credentials have gone by the wayside now, and he's in jail. And count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's amazing, isn't it? That is amazing. So verses 7 and 8, Whatever things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss. So justification, or salvation from the penalty of our sins, costs nothing. All we do is believe. But Paul had lost a few things. And he counts those things that he lost garbage, rubbish. See, and that's the, that's the path of discipleship. When you believe in Jesus, you're saved, and you're going to heaven, there's no cost to you. The thief on the cross, you know, he was nailed to a cross, but that's not because he did anything for God. It's because he was, you know, an insurrectionist and against the state, and he was being punished. But he believed in Jesus, and he, he went to heaven. Just because of that, he did nothing at all. And that is how we are saved. But Paul talks about the discipleship and losing things. You can lose things as a disciple. But what he's saying here is that what you gain back is worth so much more than what you lose. When the Lord asks you to give up something, he replaces it with something much greater. So verses 9 and 10, that he may be found in him. So when God sees us, we are in Christ. He sees Christ when he looks at us. Not having a righteousness of my own. So See, the Pharisaic righteousness, the way they twisted the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law was meant to drive people to the Messiah. It was, it, huh? To the Messiah. Because they, they would learn that I can't do it. I can't do it. I just have to trust in God and this, and this uh, deliverer who's coming. That is how they were saved in Mosaic Judaism. And, um, but, the Pharisees changed it so that they could obey it. It, twist, it twisted it. And it led to pride. See, that's a, he, Paul was blameless in the law. That's what he said in the Pharisaic law. See, and it leads to pride. And God hates pride. So anyway, the righteousness that counts is not our own. It is his. So discipleship leads to experiential knowledge personally with the Lord. And that's what he says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What is that? Yeah, that's supernatural activity in your own life. Has anybody experienced that? Supernatural activity in your own life. I have experienced that, and it comes through prayer. Sometimes the Lord just surprises you, <laughs> you know. For example, we were hauling this uh, couch, very heavy couch, from my mom's house to the dump, and it was me and Susanna, and I'm not that strong, you know. I'm I'm a doctor, for, uh, and uh, we're trying to lift this thing because they had a, a barrier; you had to throw it over, and we're like, oh, we're struggling, we couldn't get it up. Right then, this big burly guy comes up and says, can I help you? Think. <laughs> you know, that is the Lord. Right. right at that moment when we're, you know, and he sends somebody boo, like that to help you. We didn't ask for that. The Lord did that. And uh, so th that is how we know him. We know him by his supernatural manifestations to us. And, the, and Jesus says that if you obey me, I will manifest myself to you. And then the fellowship of his sufferings, you know, because when we're an aggressive Christian, we people lash out at us sometimes. So if we are persecuted, he will sustain us through that in the fellowship of his sufferings. And then in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, that's what we're looking forward to, is the glorification of our bodies. 
that they are eternal, they don't need glasses, they don't need insulin, they don't need anything else, and they work right for a long time. <laughs> and that's what we're looking, and that's what we get back uh, when we give it over to Jesus. And so what Paul says is it is worth it losing all this, all his titles, you know, and everything. It is worth it because of what you get back. Anything else about that? So it's a reason to rejoice. Okay, Lord, we thank you for all these reasons to rejoice. We do look forward to our own glorification, which will happen at the rapture. We're excited. We pray that you would come soon. Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Amen.